Hi everybody, my name is Hao Li. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Pinscreen, and our company actually builds photorealistic AI-driven virtual avatars. So today I'd like to give you a presentation about virtual connectivity and avatars uh, in a post-pandemic world. So <clears throat> this is the world we're living in today. Uh, I think everyone is familiar with that. It's no longer a dystopian fiction. Uh, this is reality. We have to wear face masks. We have to enforce physical distancing and also the entire life events industry is being shut down, right? So we don't really have music concerts anymore, sports matches, or even conferences. And that's probably the reason why, you know, this is the way uh, we're presenting our uh, presentations these days. And uh, the same goes for businesses, right? So a lot of the businesses are forced to go online. And, um, you know, a lot of companies are exploring new ways um, to replace the physical experience that we can have, uh, that we had before. So um, some studies say that 85% of all the customer interactions are going to be held uh, without human agents uh, by 2021, meaning that a lot of AI is going to be used for that. And this is another um, you know, thing that I'm, pre I'm pretty sure you're all familiar with, self-isolation, working from home, and you know, the, the way people are interacting these days is you know, simply through video chats. Now, there are a couple of really interesting technological trends uh, that are um, showcasing the possibilities of what's ahead of us. And a lot of that is actually using digital humans to uh, enable a new form of digital interaction. So let me show you a couple of examples. Um, this is a great example from uh, Facebook Reality Labs where uh, they're showcasing a prototype system that allows people that are remote to interact um, you know, naturally as if they were, you know, in the same space, but it's all virtual, right? So two people being remote, uh, becoming virtual avatars and having the ability to have a face-to-face -face conversation. So we're still a couple of years ahead uh, to um, really um, use this kind of technology. One reason is that you need a very, very sophisticated system uh, to capture the person and also to process all the data. There's also a couple of solutions right now that are sort of using virtual avatars to uh, represent humans inside an augmented reality um, setting. So here's an example from spatial.io. So people wearing AR headsets and uh, um, reenacting themselves uh, using a virtual avatar and having the ability to collaborate or have social interactions in the same space. And it's not just interactions between different humans, right? It can also be interactions between a human and a machine as shown in this example. So here's a great example from the company in uh, New Zealand called uh, Soul Machine. They're developing human-like virtual avatars where uh, that are, you know, replacing AI chatbots, right? So this allows you a more social interaction with, with virtual avatars. I'm going to show you a couple of examples of how we're approaching this problem uh, at Pinscreen. Now, the same thing goes for virtual events, right? So a uh, great example is um, <clears throat> this uh, virtual life concert that is uh, you know, being thrown by uh, rapper Travis Scott inside a game platform, right? So they're using Fortnite to basically allow the performer to reach out to tens of millions of viewers uh, in real time. So this is a great way to you know, not only replace physical concerts, but uh, really to have a much bigger reach. And this really shows the potential of using virtual humans, um, you know, for um, things such as life events. And we're also, you know, seeing a lot of really interesting uh, trends like virtual influencers or virtual celebrities um, of people that don't really exist, uh, people that are uh, completely generated uh, by studios and um, have the ability to reach out to people and do, uh, you know, um, marketing with brands uh, and, uh, you know, wearing all kinds of like fashion lab, uh, labels. So the main issue with these kind of digital characters is that there's still a lot of production to be, uh, that, that is necessary to generate these kind of uh, CG characters, right? And uh, this is something that we all know from uh, the VFX or gaming industry. Um, if you, you know, if you've seen uh, movies like Star Wars, Fear 7, Blade Runner 2049, or, you know, in this example, Terminator Dark Fate, uh, you can see that um, there's a long history of 
how the industry is building highly realistic virtual humans um, <clears throat> that is there to basically replace, you know, uh, real actors, right? So the idea is that you have um, actors that have age or that have passed away and you're trying to recreate a digital double to replace them. Now, this is something that, you know, is already possible to generate very, very realistic humans. But then the problem is that uh, the production cost is extremely high. You need a lot of digital artists, a lot of engineers to work on these things. You need very sophisticated capture devices to digitize the humans. And in the end, it's going to take, you know, months to just create a couple of minutes of animation. Now, the real time uh, graphics industry is also pushing the limits. So this is coming a lot from the gaming industry. Here's a great example from uh, Digital Domain, um, where um, Doug Rubble is basically uh, driving his virtual app, his own virtual avatar uh, in real time using a you know performance capture suit, head cam, and um, is basically showcasing an end-to-end -end solution from capture to real-time rendering. So he can basically puppeteer his character in real time. Now, uh, this is great, uh, but the only problem here is really that uh, you still need to uh, create these assets somewhere, right? So creating these assets is not something that is uh, very easy, and it still takes months to actually generate high-fidelity assets. And <clears throat> my previous lab at uh, USC, you know, we were highly involved in, uh, you know, production level uh, human digitization uh, services. So we have, you know, frequently um, digitized celebrities. Uh, here's an example of Will Smith. And you can see that if we basically scan the person, right? So the process is, the first step is basically we have to scan the person's face. We have to um, digitize its texture, it, you know, all the geometry of the face and, you um, you know, all the physical properties of how light reflects uh, with the skin in order to reproduce a, you know, plausible, uh, realistic rendering inside a new virtual environment. And this process typically requires a very, very sophisticated capture device. Here's, a, you know, one of the um, capture devices that we were using. Uh, it's called LightStage X. And this is a, you know, so-called multi-view photometric stereo uh, capture device that allows you to digitize, you know, high fidelity geometry of the person, you know, down to the pore levels, um, uh, you know, complex reflectance properties of the skin, uh, etc. And, you know, is using, you know, very complex setting with various LEDs, you know, that we can control uh, during the process. And, you know, normally we would ask the actor to perform certain facial expressions, we would digitize everything, and then there's a long process of, um, processing uh, the data. Now, this is something that obviously, you know, it's not something that people can easily afford uh, if we're thinking about building technologies that are accessible by anyone, right? So if we're thinking about telepresence or, uh, you know, the use of VR headsets, um, it's unlikely that people are <clears throat> going through a capture process that requires a lab setting or a game studio or a VFX studio. <clears throat> so that's basically one of the things that we're solving here at Pinscreen is how do we democratize the digitization of humans, right? How can we use the least amount of information that we can actually capture from someone? For example, taking a picture of that person, having a short recording of that person and still get a similar uh, quality, right? So the challenge here is how can we use this very limited amount of information to still digitize a person? And the way we're solving this problem is we're using artificial intelligence to basically analyze the input and have the ability to generate new content, right? So we're using deep learning to generate content. Now, <clears throat> content generation um, has a, you know, there has been a lot of advances in deep learning to generate photoreal content. So um, one of the <clears throat> pioneering examples here is the use of so-called GANs. GAN stands for Generative Adversarial Network, right? So it's a deep neural network <clears throat> that has the ability to generate content uh, and it's trained in a way, in an adversarial way, um, in order, you know, for using a large amount of real world data, right? So instead of having <clears throat> a computer graphics model that is designed by artists, what we're doing here is we're actually training a deep neural network with a lot of real data and it has the ability to generate new ones 
from those that it has learned. So this is a technique that has been uh, invented uh, in 2014 by Ian Goodfellow and co-workers. Uh, he works now at Apple. And one thing that you can see is that he has shown for the first time that you know if you train a deep neural network with a lot of photos of people, it has the ability to generate a new one um, of a person that doesn't really exist based on observation that it has seen. And you can see that every year, right, we have huge advancements, like the quality improves significantly. And we've reached to a point uh, these days that we can generate really high resolution images of you know entirely new person, and it looks absolutely plausible, right? So it's really hard to find artifacts now uh, nowadays. <clears throat> now the question is, how do we use this kind of technique in our setting of virtual avatars? So for virtual avatars, what we need is we want to, you know, have a user be able to just take a picture and then <clears throat> generate a three-dimensional model. So first we have to convert, you know, 2D into 3D, get all the geometry, but not only the static model, right? We really need to build a dynamic model that has all kinds of facial expressions. So let me show you <clears throat> one of the techniques uh, that we call Pagan. Pagan stands for Photoreal Avatar GAN. And it's a modification of this GAN, uh, of, ge of a generative adversarial network that is designed to generate photorealistic expressions. So what you see on the upper right, these are <clears throat> single photographs of people who have never seen any expressions of them. On the left, you have a driver, right? So he's basically doing any facial performances and what we do is we analyze his facial expression and we use that to generate you know, a photorealistic face from him. So what you see on the bottom right, these are new images of people that we're generating. Now, <clears throat> one of the obvious you know, things we can do with that is we can say, well, how about we just use these, this face and uh, replace this, the person, right? So we can do simple tricks like uh, face replacement uh, using this uh, AI-based approach. Now, let me show you an example of AI face replacement. Hello, everyone. It's me, President Trump, the greatest president in the history of presidents. There's some disturbing things on the internet, the internet, and I know the internet. No one knows the internet. Like, I know the internet because I'm smart. I'm really, really smart. I know technology and I have a really big brain. And my big brain is telling me there are some fake videos out there. They call them deep fakes. Deep fakes. And there's this company, Pin Screen. Pin Screen. And they've got, like, this genius guy running it. He's not, he's not as much of a genius as I am, but he's very smart with this technology this technology. So if you see me in a video and I'm not saying how incredibly smart I am and how big my brain is and how I have the greatest memory in the history of memories and how I aced my cognitive test, it's probably not me. So don't trust it. Don't trust the deep fakes. All right, so you get the idea. And it uh, seems like we won't <coughs> be seeing... Um, uh, him for uh, you know very soon. Anyway, um, <clears throat> so uh, this is um, a technology that you know, might have heard that is very very similar to another technology called deep fakes. And uh, deep fakes actually emerged on the internet back in 2017. That was around the time we developed uh, our technology as well. And <clears throat> it's um, uh, one of the um, things that happened is that it emerged on the internet. Uh, it was um, open sourced uh, by anonymous per person. And, you know, for the first time it was used for, uh, you know, for, uh, unfortunately for the first time it was used for applications such as non-consensual pornography where, you know, <clears throat> people are using <clears throat> celebrities and uh, putting their faces into, you know, pornographic content. And that's actually one of the issues of, you know, these kind of technologies it's very hard, you know, it's very easy to create content that is, that looks very, very compelling and uh, realistic. And it's very hard to actually, um, you know, <clears throat> avoid, uh, you know, its use for cases such as harassment or defamation. So that's one of the <clears throat> reasons why, you know, we, we have started to look into how do we approach this problem, right? So the first thing that's really important is that we have to mention that 
um, it's uh, you know it's something that we have to raise awareness. We have to educate people that it's very very simple to use these kind of photorealistic faces to um, you know to cause harm, right? And um, not to mention other potential uh, dangers such, such as the spread of disinformation or you know making politicians say things they've never said. So uh, one of the things that you know Pin Screen is also working on is on the detection side. So as we know how to generate very realistic faces, we also have a very uh, important tool to improve the detection of, you know, these kind of uh, doctored, um, you know, AI synthesized media. So this is one thing that uh, we've been starting to look into. And um, we started to push the capabilities of generating extremely realistic, uh, you know, face replacement or um, also known as deep fakes and um, this is something that allows us to actually uh, help improve detection algorithms so let me show you an example of a high resolution deep fake that uh, allows us to generate something that is nearly undetectable by um, you know existing uh, deep fake detectors so let me play that Boa noite. Dirijo-me a todos os cidadãos brasileiros para dizer que nunca houve injustiça tão grande quanto a prisão do presidente Lula. Que crime esse homem daí cometeu? Ele não tem triplex da praia. Ele não tem sítio coisa nenhuma. Quem nunca botou o nome dos netos num pedalinho disso daí? Se bem que eu colocaria só numerais. 01, 02 e 03. <risos> mas como um defensor da justiça social, das questões ambientais e dos índios, sempre me espelhei na figura de Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva para seguir lutando por um Brasil mais justo e menos desigual. A luta continua, companheiro. So, one of the what you can see here on the right, you have uh, the impersonator. So it's a person. Uh, a person that we have <clears throat> uh, uh, hired to basically, um, you know, have a very similar look as uh, Jair Bolsonaro. And what we've done is we've taken, you know, several minutes of videos of Jair Bolsonaro to train a deep fake model, to train a face replacement model in order to generate per frame a realistic face of him. Now, this is something that, you know, you can obviously see uh, what kind of content uh, we can create, but it's not only the ability to generate very convincing, um, you know, face replacements. Um, this is something that we can also generate in real time. So here's uh, a collab uh, an example of a collaboration that we've done um, in partnership with uh, the World Economic Forum, right? So uh, earlier this year, uh, we've shown a system um, at, uh, in Davos uh, that showcases the advance the, the rapid advancement of these kind of technologies, right? So the idea is we're showing people how even in a real time context, in a life context, how we can actually reenact as someone as somebody else, right? So we take uh, a couple of celebrities, and we can become these people uh, in real time, right? You can instantly switch between another person. And we're showcasing the, the technology to world leaders. Now, um, one thing uh, that you can imagine here is that uh, this is a potential danger for, you know, uh, live streaming. So I can basically have a video chat um, and basically uh, become someone else, right? Uh, you can also think of potential fraud uh, applications where uh, someone tries to uh, hack into a bank account of someone um, that is using, you know, not just face recognition, but also uh, lifeness detection, right? So. Uh, if you have the ability to use this, um, you know, this would pause a potential uh, danger, security danger for um, banks, for example. Now, we're not uh, in the business uh, mainly of, uh, you know, building uh, AI face replacements. So these are basically examples that showcases the potential of these kind of technology. What we're ultimately developing these AI synthesized faces for is to improve the photorealism of virtual characters. So let me show you how we're using this technology. So a state-of-the-art real-time game engine, such as Unreal, 
can basically generate you know fairly convincing faces like you can see on the left um, but you can still see that there's something artificial about the person's face right so the person still has this very robotic look that's what we call the uncanny valley effect and um, if we apply our neural face rendering technology on top of that what we get is this very very convincing face of the person so all we need is just a couple of minutes of the person's facial recording and we can basically generate this highly convincing uh, virtual avatar of the person that you can see on the right so let me play that hi this is digital mick kind of the successor to meet mike this is me driving this digital character in ue4 thanks to a persona rig from three lateral that's reading my expressions feeding into a three lateral facial rig inside ue4 i also have on an xn suit to get my body motion and this is great we love it but as much fun as i am sitting here at the motors lab in sydney i can take this to the next level thanks to our friends at Hinscreen. this is digital michael now michael is being fully driven by digital me so just to be clear about this, Mike Seymour is driving Digital Mick and Mick is driving Michael. And Michael lifts the level of realism enormously. It's doing that because it's a generative adversarial network, a GAN. In fact, it's the Pagan 2 technology from Pinscreen. And this is enabling me to produce this incredibly realistic, lifelike version of me and control it. I think it's extraordinary technology and it's really going to be a game changer. I hope you'll agree. And uh, one thing you can see is that, you know, we can actually drive, uh, you know, the facial performance using, you know, simply an iPhone uh, in this case. So we have an iPhone recording, we're tracking the facial performance, and we can automatically retarget his facial expressions onto any uh, virtual avatar. And all this is being rendered in real time uh, using our uh, neural face rendering technology. And, you know, there are many applications for that. You know, some of the uh, application that Pinscreen is looking into is how do we uh, create you know virtual fashion models uh, for uh, the fashion industry here is an example uh, that you know is being um, automatically generated and also rendered uh, in real time um, you can post the avatar arbitrarily and you can actually dress them uh, using um, you know any kind of dresses here are a couple of additional examples of celebrities that we can actually digitize and um, we can also bring them to life. So we can automatically uh, you know, generate content for websites, for uh, social media platforms, etc. So we're working with a couple of uh, fashion companies to um, develop, uh, to um, generate uh, these type of virtual humans. So ultimately, we want to also create virtual avatars that are fully autonomous, right? avatars that are not just a you know graphics shell uh, but an avatar that has that comes with artificial intelligence with it that has the ability to interact with us uh, on a day-to-day -day basis so let me show you an example so um, this is our uh, pin screen virtual assistant uh, technology so it's basically a cloud-based solution um, that is uh, entirely so all the rendering all the AI is running entirely on the cloud. Uh, it's scalable to you know reach out to um, you know thousands of tens of thousands of users. And uh, one of the key things is that we have a full stack solution for artificial intelligence and uh, natural language processing. Right, so it goes from um, interacting naturally uh, with the avatar through an interface. So um, you know typically a web browser or just a smartphone. And we have the ability to basically, um, you know, do voice recognition, have a highly sophisticated deep language model that um, <clears throat> that generates the responses based on the um, based on the uh, the voice input, and then generate speech and also generates lip animation gestures automatically, and then goes through our neural face rendering to produce a photorealistic avatar, and this is then streamed in real time. Um, using video streaming uh, to uh, the user. So one of the applications here is really to build, you know, for example, a next generation virtual shop staff that goes beyond, you know, AI chatbots or voice assistant. One, a virtual human that has the ability to um, do customer service or even just to be a, you know, social companion uh, to a person. So let me give you a demo 
of how the system works. Um, here in this uh, specific demo, you can see this is a standard web browser and the person can be, you know, can naturally interact with that avatar, um, you know, simply through voice, right? So it's a freestyle demo, um, nothing is scripted uh, and the entire avatar is running on the cloud and it's being streamed in real time onto um, the laptop. So let me give you a demo of that. Start recording button that can start interacting with her. Hey, how are you doing today? I'm good. I've been watching a lot of anime recently. What about you? Oh, really? Huh. Uh, I haven't been watching any uh, animes. Um, I've been working a lot lately. What do you do in your free time? My job is pretty boring. I just work online and browse. <laughs> Uh, I'm, well, my job is kind of interesting. Uh, we're actually, uh, working on some state of the art, artificial intelligence technologies. That's cool. How long have you worked in that field? What's your favorite thing to do? Um, I've been working in that field for over 10 years now. Um, but yeah, my favorite thing to do is. All right. So what I've been showing you now is um, <clears throat> virtual avatars that can be generated from pictures, uh, virtual avatar, you know, with including facial expressions, etc. And also uh, virtual avatars that are um, designed in a way that they are fully autonomous and have, you know, come with an artificial intelligence and can interact with people. Now, if we go back to the title of this presentation, right, we're talking about virtual connectivity. So obviously we can become virtual avatars and uh, control them in real time. Uh, but then another type of, um, you know, interaction is to capture something and to stream something directly, right? S similar to, you know, having a video chat, but the idea is that the whole thing is in 3D. And that's what we call volumetric teleportation. So the idea of volumetric teleportation is the, the idea of like, scanning yourself completely in 3D and every frame stream that, you know, over the internet or um, a distance so that people can uh, interact remotely uh, in real time. Now, this is not a new thing, right? So this is something that, for example, a couple of years ago, you know, Microsoft Research has uh, been showcasing. So this is their holoportation system. And the idea is that, you know, two people who are wearing, for example, HoloLens um, AR display uh, have the ability to see each other from this uh, at the distance and the way their bodies are being digitized and streamed over the net is by using a capture uh, solution right so in here the capture solution you can see it's a very special room where you have a lot of cameras around the person uh, and in addition to cameras you also have real-time depth scanners right that are you know turning the point clouds into a mesh uh, into a texture mesh that is then streamed over the internet. Um, here's another example uh, from a company called Evercoast. So they're using several, you know, Intel RealSense depth sensors that are placed around the person and it's digitizing the person in real time. Now, this is great. Uh, you can basically digitize an entire person with clothing, um, you know, and, uh, you know, pretty much see a 3D video of the person. Uh, the main issue with this kind of technology is that you need multiple cameras around the person. You pretty much need a capture studio to be able to digitize the person. Now, if you remember in Star Wars, right? Star Wars, uh, you had R2-D2 that is, you know, capturing someone and you have the hologram of, you know, Princess Leia that, that is appearing. Um, the question is, how did they capture the person? They were never inside a capture studio. And if we think about it, wouldn't it be great if we didn't need so many cameras around the person, right? This is a technology that I find very unlikely to be democratized because of such requirements. And the reason why we're still using video chats these days is that, you know, every cell phone or every laptop is equipped with a single webcam and, you know, nothing is seeing myself, you know, around me. Now, we started to think a couple of years ago on would it be possible to use AI to predict your full three-dimensional shape, including the texture, and have a complete digitization from a single view, meaning that I only see you from the front 
and I have an artificial intelligence that has the ability to predict what my back would look like. So we started to work on this and we came up with a solution uh, that allows us to digitize cloth human bodies from a single picture and uh, the entire model uh, generate, you know, includes a full texture of the person and the person is, you know, has clothing or even props. So this was initially a collaboration between USC Waseda and UC Berkeley. Here's a picture of me um, at, you know, in Sydney with my friend Mike Seymour. And the first step was, you know, we first do a foreground background segmentation. So we use a, uh, a semantic segmentation network to basically remove the background of the person. So this is something uh, that is solved. And the next step is to use a technology called pixel implicit, um, uh, pixel aligned implicit function, uh, al also known as PIFU, uh, to basically <clears throat> digitize myself in 3D. So you can see that from this input photo with the background removed, I can digitize myself in 3D, including the texture. And the idea here is that we have a 3D deep neural network that that is trained with a lot of photometric stereo of people with clothing in different varying poses and varying lighting conditions. And what we train the network to do is to predict how the entire surface of the person would look like if only a partial view of the person exists. And let me show you a couple of examples of results that we can generate, right? So we, on the left, you can see a few pictures of, you know, fashion models and, um, you know, there are no other information than that, right? It generates a complete mesh of the person. Uh, you have, uh, you know, even, uh, you know, the woman on the upper left, she's holding a jacket. You can see even the jacket is being digitized. Another thing that's really interesting is that you can see on the lower right, right? So from the front, you can't really see the bending of the knee, but um, the digitized model does have a slight bending of the knee. So it's predicting this correctly, right? Here are a couple of additional examples. Now, one of the main issues with this technology is that for each single frame, it still takes a couple of minutes to, um, you know, digitize the 3D model. So one thing that we have built uh, recently, we've developed recently, is a hierarchical uh, multi-resolution uh, representation that allows us to generate these meshes in real time, right? So it combined with state-of-the-art GPUs, and um, some scheduling engineering for um, you know, deep neural network processing, um, we can basically achieve real-time performance, meaning that we have to go three orders of magnitude faster than um, you know, uh, the traditional method. So let me show you an example. So this example shows how we actually build a volumetric teleportation system that is real-time, right? So you have all you need is basically this single Logitech webcam. It's a hundred dollar webcam, and it's pointing at you know um, the subject there who is you know wearing clothing. He can take off his clothes, and on the right you can actually see a fully textured mesh that is being digitized in real time, right? And to really show you that it's you know 360, you know that we have the 360 information, we're rotating now the um, generated model. So that's what you see here in the middle. Um, you can see we're rotating it and you can see how we can actually digitize his performance in real time. Now, one thing we can do is we can take that data and stream this directly onto an AR um, device. So, for example, we can stream it to a tablet that where we're using basically the IMU to uh, do you know, self-localization. Uh, self so it knows its position. So we can actually see the person by moving the tablet around uh, you know, this can be fully remote and we can basically digitize the person in 3D. So you can easily imagine how we can, you know, integrate that inside a AR device or VR device uh, to see the other person in 3D. So I think the only missing component here, right, is <clears throat> the ability to have a holographic, um, you know, visualization of the virtual avatars. And, uh, you know, some of the technologies I've shown you are sort of like key building blocks uh, for a path toward a future like this, right? So things that we have seen in Blade Runner 2049, you know, fully intelligent virtual avatars um, that are, you know, uh, fully 3D uh, and that we can naturally interact with. So 
this is sort of like the uh, direction that we're moving uh, toward. This is the vision that we have at Pinscreen is really to build a future where we have the ability to interact with digital humans. And one thing that I really believe is that we're going to soon interact more with virtual humans than with real ones, right? And I think it's not necessarily something that's good or bad, uh, but um, you know, if we use it in the right way, um, they're going to help us with a lot of things. Imagine how we can democratize education, how we can have you know uh, advice from a doctor in real time uh, instantly, right? We can have instant demand of you know someone who can help us who isn't necessarily available, and we can interact with them naturally. So uh, that's it. Um, thank you very much for uh, listening. Um, if you have uh, any questions, uh, feel free to contact me at how at pinscreen.com or uh, visit our website at pinscreen.com uh, to learn more about uh, what we're up to. Thank you very much. Oh my God. Now that's, it's not the only thing I can say, but it's definitely the first thing I can say. Um, I hope uh, how is, is, is live with us uh, now. There's a lot of questions that we got. I have uh, about a million questions um, and, uh, and comments to, to make on that. Hi, uh, hi, la hi, how are you? Good. Good. Nice to meet you. Nice it's to great to be here. Thank you. Great to, great to have you here. Uh, we're in uh, day two uh, out of five of Future Summit. We had some really uh, amazing speakers and, and panels so far and conversations. Um, I, I just, uh, um, I don't know where to start, but I know we have about 15 minutes, so I'll be very brief. Um, sure. Everything that you said, um, you ended with, you know, how do we use it? It's important. Uh, does it ever scare you in any way? No, I think it's um, in general, you know, the thing with uh, many technologies um, and um, a lot of that has to do, you know, with um, that technologies are neither good or bad. So I think there's nothing to be really, we, we really have to be afraid of uh, technology itself, right? Especially uh, the rapid advancement of artificial intelligence um, can always be used for something that is good or something that is bad. So it really depends on how we use it. But one thing that's important is that people understand how these kind of technologies evolve, how they work, um, so that um, they can be responsible for, uh, you know, what, uh, what they're building and that uh, some of these technologies are not being misused. Yeah. The, um, there's uh, one, uh, one question from a, a common friend, uh, Adrian, um, and he says, will uh, AI digital avatars look at humans as gods, as we look at or used to or still do? Uh, do you think, well, how do you look at that, actually? Yeah, that's a, that's a very philosophical question. Reminds me of a lot of the Ridley Scott movies. Um, I think, uh, it de first, of, first of all, it depends on how we program the AI virtual humans. Nowadays, uh, they will think whatever we program them to, and they don't really think. They basically just execute a program. But it might uh, come a day where <clears throat> they are complex enough to basically simulate something that maybe we sense as consciousness, right? And I'm not sure, you know, we still fully understand what consciousness is. Um, but uh, if we, if the AI system sort of simulates this, then it's actually really hard to predict um, how they would position themselves in this world, right? And yeah. how they would evolve. I think most likely it would be very different than how humans are because computers are by, um, they're by definition different in terms of like how they, how they function, right? So it's brains, uh, real brains and <clears throat> and uh, whatever people are, you know, and processes are completely different things. Yeah. And even when we talk about deep neural networks, they also function uh, completely different than the human brain. Um, I think you, we all remember that in January 2020, when we looked at 2020, we were looking at Tokyo uh, Olympics, we were looking at US elections, et cetera, et cetera. Now, the US elections actually happened. Uh, but one of the trends that we also put in our, our January trends report was about deepfakes. We actually have a section on that. Uh, and, and 
we, we thought that deep fakes are going to be a big deal in the US elections. And they were not, to my knowledge, a big deal. They were not even a small deal. Why do you think mm -hmm. that happened? Is this something that you and other yeah. friends have, have pushed uh, against? Or is it because it's, I don't know, maybe too expensive? Um, well, it would be great to think that, you know, because um, people have raised so much awareness, the people are educated enough to know that this could be a deep fake. Yeah. And as a matter of fact, um, there has been many instances where people have used manipulated videos um, and, uh, you know, social media platform have taken steps uh, to flag uh, disinformation. But I think there's also a lot of other reasons, right? One of the reasons, for example, is that deepfakes still take quite some work to do to make it really good. Um, it's possible to make them nearly perfect, but it still takes a lot of work. And um, it's something where I think you don't need anything more sophisticated than deepfakes to spread disinformation. You can just really write an article that, you know, and put like some random pictures in it and just uh, spread this information very easily. And one of the reason is because um, <clears throat> it's not just like what the information is. It, the, one of the reason is how people consume information nowadays. Um, a lot of it uh, is through social media. And the problem with social media platforms is that I'm not really in control of what I watch, right? It's the, uh, there's, there are algorithms behind that are optimizing to what I should watch. And if people can control that or social media platforms can control that, then um, you know that's a much easier way to control what people should believe and should not believe. Yeah, true. Um, yeah. Uh, we had a, last night, uh, roughly at the same time, we had a, another speaker from Los Angeles actually um, um, called Oli Rankin. Um, and uh, Oli used to uh, create, uh, he was 20 years in the mo movie industry and he, he used to uh, create the, the battle scenes in Lord of the Rings or X-Men and etc. Alice in Wonderland, uh, Through the Looking Glass, sorry. And we talked a lot about virtual reality and augmented reality with, with him. Mm -hmm. um, my question is, how do you see the evolution of, of augmented reality, not VR necessarily? Um, and you did show us some parts of it, but how far and how fast do you think we'll go in the next five years, let's say? Yeah, so I think there are multiple aspects to it. So first of all, um, <clears throat> in terms of augmented reality or virtual reality, the classic you know, um, idea of what it is, is people wearing a headset and then seeing things, virtual objects combined with you know, real world objects. And um, a lot of that hasn't materialized as we thought, right? So, you know, um, the whole hype uh, of VR and AR, I mean, the biggest hype was probably a few years ago, and it's sort of like fading out a little bit, although, you know, Oculus is still very strong and pushing the technology. But um, I think it's taking another form. Um, if you look at companies like TikTok or Snapchat, right? So they um, see augmented reality as the content itself and not necessarily the way you would see things. And they are actually uh, quite successful in terms of like, you know, how do I, you know, enable things like self-expression? How do I um, <clears throat> invade the you know physical space with augmented, uh, not just information, but really content, right? And I think it's taking, I think it's growing faster on the content creation side rather than on the hardware side. Um, so, and so what that means, I think what we can predict is that we're going to have more and more virtualized content, which is basically content that isn't real, um, and but might be more fun than real ones. And yeah. they don't necessarily have to be something bad, something negative, but imagine if people can use all their imagination and create visual effects that were only possible for big companies in the past, um, you know, that's another way of storytelling. So I think there's going to be a lot of new tools allowing people to not just use content and put them inside the ones that they're recording, but also ones that they can actually create. And there's going to be probably some very interesting stuff in the future where people are going to use um, natural language processing to generate the content that they really want. Yeah, I recently used an app uh, that uh, put my face in uh, 
in uh, the Iron Man suit and, and stuff like this. And um, it, well, it first made me look really good, um, but it made me feel really good. And I think this is the monetization part that uh, I'm, I'm not going to buy more, but other people will, of course, uh, buy more. Now, I see behind you a green friend, uh, and uh, many of us have uh, uh, lived our childhood and adult life uh, with, with that guy, but I want to talk about another uh, type of uh, movie, but still with Star, but Star Trek. Um, mm -hmm. So in the Star Trek series, you had something called the holodeck, if uh, right. I think you, you, you know and you remember, um, and it always fascinated me, um, and it always felt to science fiction to be true. Now, holograms, um, it feels like holograms even now are um, a very, have a very slow technical uh, or, you know, <laughs> road ahead. Um, how fast and how far do you think we'll get uh, into having something like a holodeck without, I repeat, without using, uh, you know, glasses or, or other devices? Right. Um... So there is some very fundamental research in, I think some universities in Japan, uh, I can remember which one. Um, and um, there's another research group, I think in Europe, where they're do showing some really, really interesting work where they can <clears throat> basically, uh, I think using lasers, they can actually create um, something that looks really like a hologram, but with simple um, I think very it's the, simple the graphics, the right? So Tokyo Agri and Tech University. I re I read something a month ago, two months ago, uh, um, and it it really blew everyone's mind. Yeah. Um, yeah. But the question uh, is, you know, so what? What are we going to do with this? Uh, there's a question from the audience as well. There was more um, from Leave You. What will be the first practical large scale application? of this technology. Of this technology meaning more like what you were saying towards the end. So in terms of, uh, you know, yeah. like, like we use uh, AR in uh, Insta, well, not in Insta, but in, in TikTok, you know, so that's the question. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think if you have the ability to have uh, a hologram, you know, appear in front of you, I think uh, it's hard to actually, for me to say right now, what is going to be the killer app. But I think there's a few that I can think, I mean, if it works really well, I think telepresence is gonna be huge. So if you have, I mean, and right now it's like the, you know, the technology that we could really use, um, you know, if I could talk to my mom who's like in Germany um, and she could just be here anytime, like making a phone call, I think it would be a lot different than having just a, um, a video conference call, right? And I think it could save a lot of the, um, you know, energy problems. For example, if people have to fly, maybe someday we'll think this is the past. And people can just teleport from one place to another and then have the ability to really co communicate other than, you know, through a webcam, but really something where um, the other person really appears here and you can have, you can make an actual connection with the person. And there's maybe another, that might be the future. There's another type of energy that, that uh, comes up, which is the energy between two people. Um, that we do have a, some form of energy, let's call it now, but, but you're yep. on a flat screen, I'm on a flat screen for you. But if you were here uh, in a yep. roughly realistic hologram, let's call it, I think the energy of our conversation would be uh, different. We have another um, a question, which is about democratization and open source uh, technology. Uh, what's your yep. take on, on that and how far uh, and how fast, this is the question that I have, constantly have for you, are we heading towards more open source uh, tech in uh, not just the, um, in holograms, but uh, you know, in the deep fake, let's call it, or, or in uh, avatar creation tech? Um, <clears throat> so in the research uh, community, I think there's, I mean, in computer vision, there's, there's a very healthy uh, open source community. So people do open source a lot of the things and that's sort of like also what pushes this field to grow very, very quickly. And I think it's nice because in the past people like to think about these are my proprietary technologies and then it's unclear what is what, uh, but you know, once you open source things, 
um, it sort of clearly separates what should be commercialized and what should be R&D and what should be a product. Because I think, you know, just having, just having, you know, a research paper or something does not mean, I mean, it's still far from a product uh, most of the times, right? And I think uh, it sort of like separates this and it also allows the field to grow. But of course, it's always a strategic, strategic decision um, whether people want to open source certain things, because there's also questions for deep fakes. If you open source things, it might also cause harm. And for deep fakes specifically, I think maybe it's not a good thing to open source, but maybe it's important to make public about what's possible now. And uh, I think one should be, should be careful about what they open source or not. There could be commercial incentives, but there could also be security in incentives. Yeah. Um, we have about five minutes. I know you also, uh, you know, need to, to end this. Um, some of my colleagues were saying, wait, what if Hao tells us at the end that he was, it was not him talking to us, but a super realistic uh, deep fake. Uh, this is just a, a funny comment. Uh, there is a question about technology um, and, uh, and cost. Um, uh, of course, it's expensive, but the question is, this comes from a young entrepreneur that we have in our future makers incubator um, and he wants to go into this business. How expensive it, is it to go into this business and what sort of technical uh, skills you might need? Um, I don't think it's, so what, what does he mean with expensive? I don't think, so here's what is expensive in these kind of fields. Uh, um, because it's mostly software. So software isn't that expensive. It's What's expensive is the engineers who work on it. The other thing that might be expensive is how do you collect data? And ah. uh, data is very valuable nowadays. Um, so that might be one way to see it as expensive, but it's nowhere near anything that people would consider expensive as for hardware companies. Uh, hardware companies are a lot more expensive and they require a much bigger investment as well. Yeah. Um, and uh, the last two questions, uh, the first one is, when you look at what happened in the U.S., uh, where you you live and work these days, uh, what is your um, uh, you know opinion on the next uh, U.S. administration? Um, not just in terms of uh, hopes, but in terms of realistic uh, expectations. Let's call them. Um, well, I think uh, it's going to be interesting. I mean. The next president, I think we, I mean, he worked in a previous administration where uh, we're all familiar with uh, under uh, President Barack Obama. So I think um, the expectation is probably that certain things are going to be similar. Um, so I think, um, I think a lot of people are looking forward to it. Um, but, you know, we'll see actually how it goes because, um, you know, you never know, right? I mean, right now, I think we have a unprecedented uh, world event. Uh, and I think it's uh, going to be, um, you know, it's, it's, it's actually challenging because um, besides of politics, I think just the world has, been, has suffered a lot from uh, the pandemic. And I think by itself, this is a challenge to see how do we solve this. And I think, um, you know, even in many other countries in Europe, in Asia, uh, I think um, people still have a lot to uh, learn from each other uh, to make it work. Uh, we can't we can't really say from you know one country or what kind of political agenda like how they will perform. Um, it's it's a very it seems like it's a very complex problem that you know. Yeah. And uh, speaking of complex and and problems, uh, the final question for you is: What is the most challenging and difficult question you ask yourself these days? That's a that's a good question. What is the most challenging question that I ask? <clears throat> well, for I mean, I'm, I basically work all the time. So, <laughs> and uh, you know, one of the things that we and I th I think it's not just these days. It's something that we constantly have to think about, which is how do we um, <clears throat> and it's probably just the stage at, at which we are in uh, in terms of company. Um, you know, we think about how do we scale. How do we, uh, we already know how to monetize, um, but I think uh, the next question, the next stage is basically how do we scale? 
and how do we um, and of course we know how to take it to the next level but I think it's really how do we and how do we bring a technology that we've only seen in movies to the real world and I think uh, and this um, surprisingly sometimes um, certain partners are very very receptive others are you know I think it just takes some time to really understand how this works yeah but I, I'm uh, quite optimistic so I'm not seeing like uh, you know <laughs> drastic challenges I think we have challenges all the time but I think those are actually really fun uh, problems to work on. Yeah, good. It was really great to have you. Thanks a lot for taking the time to, to join us live as well. I know it's a huge, you know, it's a busy busy day for uh, for you. The day is just starting uh, in, in your world, in on your planet, uh, and the day is coming to an end in our part of the world. We do have two more sessions, uh, so it's nine o'clock in the evening in in, in uh, our uh, Central and Eastern Europe uh, part. Um, thanks again, Hal, for joining us, and uh, you know, uh, hope to, to keep in touch uh, and, and get you eventually one day to Europe back um, and, and uh, see you, or if we find some money to get you as a hologram uh, to, to the future <laughs> summit that. of uh, 2030 or something. <laughs>